This is Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell, all talk and all crime. On what would have been the 100th birthday of President John F. Kennedy, we examined the groundbreaking investigation into the missing first bullet fired in the JFK assassination that fateful day, November 22, 1963. Was there a fundamental misreading of the Zapruder film? Does six seconds in Dallas become 11 seconds in Dealey Plaza? All that's today on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Max Holland was on this show previously for his book, Uncovering the Real Motivation Behind Watergate's Deep Throat, Demolishing the Legend Fostered by Bob Woodward. He's the editor of the website, Washington Dakota, the author of Leak, Why Mark Felt Became Deep Throat, and the Kennedy Assassination Tapes. Regarding today's show, Max's article appears in a, in a technical journal, the Association for Crime Scene Reconstruction. It's entitled, A Technical Investigation Pertaining to the First Shot Fired in the JFK Assassination co-author Frank Durong of Forensic Metallurgy Associates, and their results became a cover story in Newsweek. He's a real seeker of truth, which is why we have him on here all the time. Hi, Max. Great to be with you, Jim. So um, before we dive into this, uh, is, do you feel that 50, 60 years of conspiracy theories might have uh, possibly be, uh, been avoided by what you uncovered? I'd like to say yes, but I don't think so. Uh, it definitely had an important effect, but I think the the fact that Oswald, there were still questions about his associations mm-hmm. outside of Dealey Plaza for, you know, the fact just, if nothing else, the fact that he had lived in Russia for two and a half years. And let me put it this way. Even if you prove that he's the sole killer, the, the murderer of the president and wounded Governor Conley, in Dealey Plaza, you still have to answer the question, did he have help outside? Was someone waiting for him or expecting to meet him? So while it's extremely important and absolutely critical to prove he was capable of all the rifle fire in Dealey Plaza, it would have still left some questions unanswered and unanswerable, and one of them being his motive. I mean, that's kind of the in the eye of the beholder. So, no, I don't think that um, a clear, compelling answer to the shooting sequence would have nipped conspiracy theories in the bud. Okay, so tell us, how did you come uh, to examine this and uh, essentially you're taking on the Zapruder view of the world? Right. Well, it all started when I was interviewing... uh, a Secret Service agent who had advanced the trip, Wynn Lawson. And he said something to me that I didn't even uh, ask him about. He said, you know, I don't care what anybody says. He was in the lead car, the car that was about mm, 40 yards or so in front of the president's car. And he said, uh, without me asking, he said, I don't care what anybody says. There was more time between the first and second shot than between the second and third. And I had heard that or read that a lot in the testimony. It's often remarked on by people who were eyewitnesses to the shooting. But somehow when he said it to me, it registered uh, you know, more deeply because he was a very impressive man uh, talk, uh, interviewing him. And so afterwards, I just couldn't get it out of my head uh, that he said that. And then I started working. I had never been... You know, as a Pruder film, film framologist, you know, what happened in this frame and mm-hmm. that frame. I had never gone into that kind of thing. Uh, but I started working it out, and it's very simple arithmetic. And if you took the whole film from when you first see the president until the third shot is fi- mm-hmm. fired, then you would get, if you if a shot was fired the f- very first instant, you would get three equally spaced shots, almost exactly equally spaced. That means a shot fired when you first see the president, the second shot is the one that hits him in the back, exits his throat, hits the governor, and then the third shot is the one that hits the president in the head. And so if you just stuck to the Zapruder film, you'd have three equally spaced shots. But Wynn said there was more time between one and two. You know, that should be appreciably more time. It can't be an instant of a second. You know where you can notice it. Yeah. Right. So when I realized the implication of what he was saying, I felt like I was 
you know, falling down, uh, uh, falling off the face of the earth. I mean, how could something not be on the Zapruder film? The Zapruder film is the urtext of the assassination. It's how we know what happened. And But if what he said was correct, that means the first shot happens before the Zapruder film starts. Now, if you actually look at the Zapruder film, it's 26 seconds long. The first seven seconds are just motorcycle policemen driving by, the advance uh, motorcycle escort. He stopped his camera. Yeah, that's what I didn't realize until I watched it today again. Right, right. It, it was always there for everybody to see, yeah. but no one thought about the implications. He only restarted it when he was sure he could see the president. And he did that because he, you know, he didn't know how much film he had left. Uh, so my whole point is that Zapruder didn't film that whole turn from Houston onto Elm. And his, if you look, if you start measuring it out, he didn't film the president until his car was 70 feet or thereabouts into Dealey Plaza. Oswald had a shot if you define it as seeing the silhouette, the rear silhouette of the president, well before the 70-foot mark. And if you look at Zapruder's testimony, which I eventually did, in his raw first statements, he only talks about seeing two shots. Like a lot of people in Dealey Plaza, he didn't recognize the first shot as a shot. And once you start putting all that together with some other eyewitness testimony, you realize that while you don't have to accept my explanation and all its particulars, there's absolutely no reason to believe that Zapruder captured the assassination shooting sequence in full. And in fact, if he's look, he saw two because he was looking through the lens, so he wouldn't have caught the first one anyway. Is that why you think uh, he thought there were only two? Well, uh, you know, p the people who tended to re recognize the first pop right away as a rifle shot were people who were experienced hunters. Oh, interesting. Um, and then, of course, if people were, you know, closer to the east side of Dealey Plaza, they also tended to realize that it was a shot and not just maybe a firecracker. By the way, that, that longer gap between one and two, not because it started earlier, but that can, can that also be partially explained because there's a tree in the way, so he would have had to wait? He shot earlier, and then the tree, and then he waits. That's absolutely correct. That's why he waits. Got it. He that's, waits the car to get clear of the tree. That hit me as you were saying that. That's, you know, that's the whole secret right there. I mean, it makes so much sense. Oswald goes up there to kill the president. He's not Hamlet-like. Should I kill him or shouldn't I kill right. him? Should I wait until he's behind the tree you know, to fire my first shot? No, he fires at the very first good shot. Now, the irony to all this is that when the Warren Commission went to Dallas in May 64, they were going to make sure that one bullet was responsible for the wounds to Governor Conley and President Kennedy. Right, to avoid the multi-shooter, right? Well, I mean, to prove it. I mean, if you yeah. if you couldn't prove it, then you were left with two shooters. Right, you got the grassy knoll guy hanging around, yeah. Yeah, so that's what they went... I mean, they had no intention of re redoing the assassination, restaging the assassination when they first got organized. They thought the FBI was going to come up with the explanation of what happened, but they saw that the FBI's explanation, you know, didn't hold water, let's put it that way. So they had to do a restaging. When they did the restaging, that's when they discovered that Oswald's first good shot had occurred at what they call position A, which was not on the Zapruder film. Let me ask you about position A, which is, uh, you describe it as the Marines looking for a mass in the back. What's the basic reason when he's coming down Houston Street, before he turns, you have a direct shot from that window. Is the basic reason you don't take that because Conley's sitting in front of him? Well, that's part of it. You've only got a very, you know, uh, you only have his head, really, for the most part. But it's also the case that if he fired a shot as the president was coming toward him, right, he could easily be spotted by the Secret Service agents. You know, there are eight of them in the car right behind. If they look up, they're they going right. to see him. And the other thing is, 
you know, if he wants to get off more than one shot, he has to swing, you know, and depending if the car accelerates. He's got to move, yeah. Right. So he scoped it out very well that his best line of fire was as the car was moving away from him, almost in a direct line, which would require minimal movement of the rifle. And, of course, he, you know, he missed him, quote-unquote, with the first shot at a distance of 90 feet, and yet he hit him in the back when the president was only 190 feet away, and then in the head at 265 feet. Explain um, the difference in time that results from where you say the first shot was to the third versus the Zapruder. How much right. extra time is brought in, et cetera? Well, you know, people react to my uh, explanation as if, uh, you know, I'm adding an hour. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's ridiculous, you know, this silly idea that it's not on the Zapruder film. But, in fact, I'm only adding five seconds to what's now generally accepted as the amount of time that Oswald had, which is eight seconds. Yeah. That's a lot of time, though, effectively. Oh, yeah, as yeah. far as shooting, yeah, yes. it's, it, it makes it... Uh, I would. I mean, I wouldn't say that an amateur can pull it off, but for anyone who was trained as a marine marksman, as Oswald was, it's it's not difficult at all. So, um, I, you know, I've, I'm sure you have too. I've sat in that sniper's nest. It looks like a tough shot, but obviously, with a telescopic lens and the timing you have, do you um, do you think it's a tough shot? And how good was do you think Oswald was? I mean, when they say marine marksman, is that valid or? Yes, I mean, you know, he wasn't the world's greatest shot by any means, but, you know, when you're you're wanting to do something as opposed to being bored, uh, doing marksmanship, practicing, that those are two different things. We had, uh, I also did a Nat Geo documentary on this issue, and we got a Marine with the same tr- basic training as Oswald had. And really, and, and, you know, in shooting, there hasn't been all that much difference between how they treat trained them now and then, and we had him uh, fire at the points we had located with a laser, and uh, to watch him do it was just raise the hairs on your back of your neck, because he did it so slowly and method- methodically really? uh, and easily, you know, like he had all the time in the world. Yeah, any other interesting uh, uh, stuff about the, the, the clues that the uh, Warren Commission uh, missed, and there's some interesting uh, people. There's Tina Pender. Um, talk a little bit about her. Yeah, she took the most important film, aside from the Zapruder film, she took the film of the car making the turn from Houston to Elm, and it shuts off just before the Zapruder film starts. There's just you know, fraction of a second gap. And so her film is actually running when I argue that the first shot was fired. Mm -hmm. But you don't see anybody reacting to it as if it's a shot. Yeah. That that moment when you see the the Secret Service guys turn around to look on the right side of the car, where is that in relation to when her film ends? Is that right about right after that, or no? Her film has ended uh, a few seconds before that. They're, they're reacting to the second shot. Oh, there's a second shot. Right. That oh. film, that that oh. f- famous photograph you're talking about uh, by the AP photographer is their reaction to the second shot. Um, so really, almost no one reacts to the first one in the pictures, at least. Well, the the sort of the icing on the top of the cake was uh, um, of my work was the Zapruder film impeaches the Zapruder film <laughs> because if you look not at the president's car but if at, at Queen Mary which was used to be the president's car but was behind him uh-huh. in Dealey Plaza is bristling with Secret Service men they do react and you can see it. At the, the very earliest frames of the Zapruder film, they're looking around. And if you read their testimony, one of them says, I thought a firecracker had been tossed to the side of the car. And if you look at him in the Zapruder film, you see him lean way over the side of the car. Now, this is before, uh, according to the standard interpretations of the Zapruder film, any shots have been fired. So he's reacting to something that occurred off the Zapruder film. And you can see him at frame, I think it's 144, which is, you know, way early for a 
the first shot as far as the standard interpretation goes. He's leaning way over the car, but the best testimony was from an agent named Glenn Bennett because he had been, I think, in Air Force Intelligence, and he knew that how important it was to put down your recollections before they were tainted by others or what you heard or unconsciously mm -hmm. incorporated. So on the plane back to, to Washington, he wrote down in a, in a little notebook exactly what happened. He said, as we turned the corner, I heard a noise, a loud noise. I looked at the boss. I was looking at the boss when he was hit in the back with the second shot. And then the third shot hit him in the head. And if you look at the Zapruder film, you can actually see him leaning to look at the president again you know, very early on in the Zapruder film. So he's acting in response to something that has just happened. Fascinating. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this, but Amos Lee Ewins or whatever. Ewins. He Amos actually, Ewins. you have, he actually saw the rifle? Yes, there were... Um, you know, after the first shot, there were s several witnesses, including Amos Ewins, who's a 15-year-old high school kid, who saw the rifle barrel in the window. And these witnesses, oh, I think um, there was another laborer who was brought up to Washington. These guys were brought up to Washington. You know, very few witnesses were actually brought up to Washington, mm -hmm. but he was one of them uh, because he had actually seen the rifle barrel in the window. And um, he was also a featured eyewitness in the 1967 CBS documentary that's probably the best that yeah, was ever that, made. Yeah. yeah, and he talks about it then. And there were people who saw the rifle in the window. Now, they didn't see, they couldn't see who was firing it. They didn't have a, you know, a perfect eyewitness description of Oswald. Yeah. But, you know. And I guess Ewins also right away move people away from thinking anything came from the grassy knoll. Right. Everybody, everybody rushed to the grassy knoll area because the president had been, you know, grievously wounded proximate to that area. Right. And that's where people rushed. And he was the one, one of them who told the sergeant, you know, you're looking in the wrong place. I saw a rifle in the window in that brick building on the corner. And then, so it took about 10 minutes or so for them to seal off the building. By then, of course, Oswald had left. Had left. Let me ask you, this is also interesting. This Dallas Deputy Sheriff Luke Mooney um, really was able to derive a lot from where the spent shells were in the sniper nest area. Right. This was, a, this was one of the most important uh, things that we, we did in our reconstruction because it's standard forensic pr practice that the pattern of spent cartridges can say a lot about the shooting sequence. And in this case, there were two shells right next to the window, and one was much further, you know, 10 feet uh, west. And we recreated this pattern by having the first shot as early as I said it, because when the cart, you know, this is a bolt-action rifle, when the cartridge is ejected, ejected, it just flies off in an arc about, you know, I'd say about 10 to 12 feet away. But when Oswald turned, you know, to fire further down Elm, the cartridges hit these cardboard boxes that he had stacked to keep his presence, you know, secret. And then they bounced back against the sill of the window. And we must have run that test 19 or 20 times and, you know, 17 times it came out exactly in the same pattern. So that was a clue that was missed by the Warren uh, Commission because Mooney wanted to talk about it, but they didn't seem too interested. Fascinating. You're listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. We're talking with Max Holland. He reexamined the ballistics, the JFK assassination. We'll look a little uh, more detail into that technical re-examination as soon as we get back.
All right, we're back with Max Holland, and um, it did this technical reinvestigation of the first shot. So uh, I'd like you to talk about the trajectory. What happened uh, to this first shot? Why did it miss? Where that? Where did it go? Okay, well, that uh, once you free yourself from the confines of the Zapruder film, you can ask that question and come to a much more plausible answer, more plausible than any answer that had been put forward. Previously, among the people who did believe it was the first shot that missed, it was either Oswald was so excited that he was going to get to, you know, he had buck fever, which is not unknown phenomenon among hunters. You know, they have such a good shot, and somehow they miss. Uh, so that was one explanation. The other was that his first shot hit a branch of the tree. Um, but the problem with that is... Uh, those the Manlicker Carcano fires bullets with such penetrating power that it's it's awfully stretches credulity to believe a tiny branch can deflect it to miss a car that was twenty feet long. I mean, maybe you would miss the president because any time something hits a bullet it's gonna have an effect, but the car is you know, huge. You weren't mm-hmm. gonna miss the whole car. Anyway, so once we freed ourselves to think outside the box, so to speak, we realized there were two obstacles during that entire trip through Dealey Plaza. One was the oak tree, which everybody knows about. The other was this two-inch wide steel pipe, which was the mast arm of the signal light on the corner of Elm and Houston, the northwest corner of Elm and Houston. And from Oswald's perspective, it interfered fleetingly with a clear line of sight. So once we realized that that could be an obstacle, we started a whole investigation. And, you know, my, being the novice that I was, I have no claim to ballistic or forensic experience. I imagine, you know, getting up on a lift and you'd rub your hand along the top of the <laughs> mast arm and you feel a dent and you could say, this is it. <laughs> well, it turned out to be a little more complicated than that, because it was still up, first we had to establish its provenance. Was it the same signal light and master? We did that, and as luck, probably the luckiest thing that happened to us is once we rubbed off the, the manufacturer's badge, Union Metal Company had installed that signal light in 1954, I think it was, when Elm became one way. And lo and behold, an old-timer there found the original drawing schematic blueprints that, you know, confirmed beyond a shadow of the doubt it was the original. So we established that. Then we went up there in the lift and um, didn't find anything. And then we realized, actually it was Tina, Tina Towner who told us that, you know, that the car wasn't in the center of Elm Street. It had been to the left. Now, because they had, it had been formerly four Lane Street changed to three lanes when it became one way. The lanes were extreme, unusually wide. So if the car wasn't centered, it was way to the left, and it was actually the end of the mast arm that the president would have passed under. So, we, you know, at first we were looking in the wrong place. But even then, it's problematic because as long as it was up there being used, uh, you, you couldn't shut off traffic. Uh, Dealey Plaza is still used. I mean, it's uh, still a major thoroughfare. So we, you know, brooded around several ideas. We offered to buy it. It turns out those things cost $15,000, and the city wasn't about to sell it. What we really worried about was because there's so much foot traffic that someday some car would hit it, and they'd take it down, just junk it without mm-hmm. an inspection. Fortunately, we pestered them so much that finally when a truck or a car did hit it, <laughs> they called us up. So we made a beeline for Dallas. But to make a long story short, um, you know, we, now we had the time to strip off the paint and look at it through microscope. Um, but we couldn't find any identifiable metal damage. So then we decided, well, we'll look at it from the other end. What would the impact point look at, look like uh, for a bullet, uh, you know, that just hit it very slightly? And we went back to a lab 
that had been used by CBS in 1967 during their documentary. We were able to get a slight def deflection to the proper angles, you know, of where it went. And it was the thick, you know, the dent or the removal of paint was about the thicknesses of a piece of paper, which means you weren't going to find. We we're looking 45 years after the event. You're not going to find it because of corrosion, and it had not been painted all the time. It was painted once every 10 years, and after initial coats, you know, it's very haphazard. So there was a lot of rust on the top. So basically, you're looking for a needle on a haystack after 50 years, and you're not going to find it. But we felt, uh, in our technical paper reports, that we felt that we did establish that it was plausible that it deflected a bullet. And we did have, from eyewitness and other documentation, phenomena, ballistic phenomena, further down in Dealey Plaza that had never been fully explained or put together. And, but the most well-known of those was James Tague's injury. He had a slight scrape on his cheek, almost as if he'd cut himself shaving, a nick. And it was noticed by a policeman then, right after the president's limousine left Ely Plaza, and they had went to where Tague was standing, and then they found a lead mark on the curb nearby, which was, after belatedly taken way by the FBI lab, was established to be consistent with the lead in the bullets used by Oswald. So we had a few clues. And basically what we put together was the first shot, you know, he took it the first good opportunity, position A or right around it, for one reason or another, either because he's using the scope or you know, he just, you know, the bullet hits the mast arm, deflects first to a skirt, a concrete skirt, I'd say about halfway down Dealey Plaza, a little more than halfway, causes this burst of dust, then hits the curb near where Tag was standing, then ricochets up to the con co concrete column of the underpass, and it's a piece of concrete from the column that hits Tag on the left cheek. And that's the triple underpass, right, where the limo would have headed out. Right, but Tag is way at the east. The limo would have head, headed out on the Elm Street underpass. He was way on the other side? or he, Yeah, he was way on the other side, uh, in the Commerce Street, the Commerce Street curb. So the the skirt, the thing it, it hit first, was, is about halfway down to the left of where the car was been on that side, right? That's correct. It's um, There's a concrete um, skirt. You know, there's a drain there, and several people had testified they'd seen a burst of dirt. And there are actually pictures right afterwards. There's a policeman guarding that area because they have reports that a bullet hit there. But, you know, of course, since it was just dirt, it... They couldn't establish anything. There was no physical evidence of a bullet. There was just people reporting this phenomena. It was the curb that had the you know, metallic residue. That so, yeah, so the first part that it hit, there's no uh, bullet uh, fragments or anything? No, no, it wouldn't have fragmented. It just, dirt, it just you know, it hit turf. Okay, hit it hit turf, okay. Right. It's, there were no fragments. The bullet didn't fracture anything. What's the, the deflections uh, that happened? What would have it have done to the velocity? Well, uh, you know, if it, it um, had been a glancing blow on the mast arm, it would have retained plenty of velocity. It would have been dis destabilized, so, you know, going sideways or uh, tangentially, and then when it hits the turf, it just... The exit velocity of a Manlicker Carcano bullet was something like 2,100 feet per second, so it's got a lot of penetrating power and... It wouldn't have been spent until it hit the the column. Is our belief? And and um, how did you uh, test um, the damage uh, that would have come from the Manlico Carcano? You you put it very close, right? Because you wanted the exact points versus um, the damage. Yeah, we had to when we did the laboratory work. We had to have it within, I think, less than a foot aim at exemplars of the mast arm because, you know, the smallest eighth of an inch difference in strike point radically changes the angle of deflection. 
So and if you're firing at the true distance of about, you know, there was the, the mast arm was 15 feet off the ground, and so it was about 70, and the arm was 75 feet from Oswald, so altogether it's 90 feet, but um, it's only 75 feet to the mast arm. You, you can't put uh, an exemplar 75 feet away and hit it with the degree of uh, care that you need to in order to prove deflection angles. So we had to, you know, we gave up the distance, which means it hit it with more force, but, you know, the force was pretty negligible difference at that. It, I found it interesting, too, that the, I guess the copper jacket of the of the bullet was off by the time it hit where Tag was, but you're able to use some sort of electrochemical analysis uh, to match it up anyway. Is that true? Did I read that right? Or? Uh, no. The, when it hit the mast arm, we posit that the bullet would have been stripped of its copper jacket. And what some witnesses saw in conjunction with the first shot was something hitting the asphalt, mm -hmm. you know, shiny. And we believe it was the copper jacket as it was stripped because it's, when a bullet that's jack, jacketed like that hits metal, it's very easy for the jet, you know, the, the bullet and the jacket will rotate uh, at different speeds if it hits anything. So it's very easy to strip the copper jacket off and just have the lead, the inner core uh, continuing on. It's important, though, right, because uh, investigators can say, well, it's not the first bullet because there's no copper on it. Right. Well, it's extremely important because when the FBI analyzed the curb, they said this bullet, this residue is consistent with Oswald's bullets he used, but it could not have hit the curb first because there's no copper residue. So that, we believed, affirmed you know what we were positing as the most likely scenario. The bullet had been stripped of its jacket by the mast arm. Now, I don't know exactly where the, where the light is on the corner as the car comes around, but it would give the impression for him to be blocked, he almost sort of had to be pointing the, the gun straight down at the ground, I assume, because it's on the corner. Well, that's, that's an interesting point. The, one of the things that you notice in the testimony is that people identify the, the, the sounds made by the first shot as being somehow different from the second and third. Mm -hmm. There was an experienced hunter in De La Plaza, and he said the first shot sounded almost like it was fired from inside a cave. And you're quite right. In order to, because the angle would be much more steep, much more of the rifle was within the building for the first shot. And that's why we believe, you know, that the workers on the fifth floor just below had plaster fall on their hair. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, I've heard that. Right, because there was so, you know, the, if more of the rifle's in, the more of the concussion's in the building. And it's much louder in the building and more forceful. And the second and third shot, much more of the rifle, not all of it, but, you know, at least much more of the stock is outside. It's interesting. When you see the um, pictures of, of the, uh, from the face front, you see those folks in the floor below looking straight up. Yeah. So they knew exactly, exactly where the noise was coming from. Absolutely. They were, they were some of the better witnesses. They didn't come out to Washington, but they testified. And I always found that, you know, that detail about the plaster falling on their hair. They were three black guys, and it was quite, you know, quite evident. Uh, uh, you know, it was one of those telling details. Little did I know that it also comports with the idea that much more of the rifle was in the building for the first shot, which is why the concussion was loudest. And that position eight, to me, doesn't sound like the greatest place to shoot, uh, especially versus the second shot, right? Well, uh, it's, it, it, you know, I mean, he's a Marine. He's trained to fire at the main body mass or the upper body mass, as it's called. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen those silhouettes. And he wouldn't be aiming at the head, I don't think. He would be aiming at, you know, the largest part of the body that would be visible. So position A is, I mean, it is true that the car is moving more laterally than later, but, I mean, if he went up, he'd have been biding his time already. I'm sure he wanted to, I mean, he'd gone up there to kill the president, and this was the first good shot. So so you believe this is the most likely scenario of what happened, and it's the left part of the arm that's holding up the lights, 
of the traffic lights. That's correct. It's the the very end of it is actually what was an obstruction uh, because you have to look at it without and imagine the car is not centered in the roadway. So it would be the last two feet. It was, I think, 190 inches altogether in length. It would be the last two feet or 24 or 30 inches. That would be the most likely point of impact. And, yes, we believe that, you know, if you look at it holistically, and, of course, you know, there are plenty of witnesses don't agree with this, but if you look at it holistically and take eyewitness, ear witness, the lab results we do have, um, you know, what Zapruder himself said about seeing two shots, if you take everything, it's the explanation that fits the facts the best. Do you think this is, uh, uh, that your findings have been accepted now? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that may answer the question. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what's interesting. Of course, you know, people, conspiracy theorists, you know, uh, wouldn't accept it to begin with. But my harshest critics have actually been non-conspiracy theorists invested in the Zapruder film. To say that something happened that wasn't on the Zapruder film is, is, you know, a cardinal sin. And, you know, it was me getting into areas that I had no expertise in, I wasn't supposed to be writing about, or, you know, everybody who writes about the assassination, they have their own spheres of influence and expertise. And here I was coming along and saying, well, no one's looked at this mass arm. You know, if we're talking about why the first shot missed, why aren't we talking about this other obstruction in Dealey Plaza. And the, the bitterest, most vitriolic criticism has actually come from people who believe Oswald did it and fired all three shots in Dealey Plaza, but it had to happen on the Zapruder film. Interesting. You're listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. We're talking with Max Holland. He re-examined the ballistics, the JFK assassination. We'll look a little uh, more detail into that technical re-examination as soon as we get back. Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell announcing a new crime show on Mondays at 6 p.m. on 1490 WGCH. All talk and all crime. The nation's biggest murderers were the go-to source for the Moxley murder of the Skakel Appeals. Financial crimes on Wall Street. Inside the crimes of Russia's Putin and more. The facts, the forensics, the inside stories. From the host of Business Talk with Jim Campbell, it's Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. All talk and all crime. Mondays at 6 p.m. Right after the Lisa Wexer Show on 1490 WGCH and WGCH.com anywhere. We're talking with Max Holland, who uncovered this new theory on the shots fired in Dealey Plaza. Let me ask you about the uh, magic bullet uh, for a second. The Warren Commission obviously said that, um, you know, that you could not have fired that Manlico Carcano uh, twice fast enough to hit Kennedy and then hit Conley, so therefore the bullet had to go through both, or there had to be two uh, shooters. Correct. Uh, how do you see that? You know, when Governor Conley made his statement from the hospital bed, I think it was on November 27th or 8th, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that everybody in the country watched. I mean, you know, who better to tell us what happened than the wounded governor who was sitting right next to the president? Right. But actually, he's not a good witness because he wanted his own bullet. Psychologically, he wanted to believe that he had been, you know, a target, too. That's interesting, because I always wondered why he was so adamant about his theory. Right. Well, it was psychological. The idea that you know, he was an afterthought or collateral damage didn't sit well with the Connollys. He wanted his own bullet, and his wife supported him in his psychological desire. So no matter how often it was explained to him, and I myself asked this question of Nellie Connolly, the Connollys insisted that the president had been shot, the governor turned around, recognizing immediately that it was a rifle shot. As he turned around, he was shot, and then the president was hit by the third shot. It and does look like that, obviously, on the film. There's enough time for him to look like he's looking around, although you see his cheeks and in grimacing sort of in the middle. And is it because it's slowed down to see that, that, you, that the, it, it's hard to believe the same bullet could have done that? In other words, in real time, it would have been much quicker. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things, you know, the, the Bruder film was 
slowed down and each frame is examined as if there are eons of time between. Right. Right. It's not like that. If you look at it real time, it's real fast. Yeah, so it could be going in, in from one to the other. Does it, did it, does it bother you that it went through all you know, the, the throat, his knee, his hand, and all that stuff not, and still not, en- ended up pristine? Well, that's a misnomer. A pristine bullet is a bullet technically that doesn't hit anything. Right, and this so that was that was a Mark Lane special, you know, to right. call that up. But you know, this was military ammunition. You have to remember, in military ammunition under either the Geneva or the Hague Convention is made to pass through people. It's thought to be more humane than to have dumb dumb bullets. You know, soft point ammunition, which if it hits you, creates a big hole and just ravages your body. Mm-hmm. Jacketed bullets, you know can make a clean wound and then go on to hit another soldier. Of course it's possible. In fact, you know, the, the, one of the biggest falsehoods of all it was, is that it was a magic bullet because, yeah. as I say often, a real magic bullet would have been a bullet that entered President Kennedy's back, exited his throat, basically after only hitting soft tissue, its velocity reduced from 2,100 to 1,800 feet per second, and then disappears. By the way, that was a, a brilliant, uh, a brilliant analysis. You'd written. I had never thought about that. But yeah, the, they would have had to find that bullet somewhere, right? Right, right. If it didn't hit Governor Conley, tell me where it went. Would it, would that have been fatal? By the way, on President Kennedy? Uh, there's, you know, differing schools of view of that. Some say because he had Addison's disease, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he would have been more likely to succumb to that. Others believed, you know, it was damaging to his spinal cord. It was traumatic. Others believe he could have survived it. Uh, you know, what I find interesting, too, is in, especially in their technical diagrams where you have the shot sequence and where the first one actually went and everything, the way it lays out, it almost says to you there's only a single shooter here. Right. Doesn't it say that? Yeah, no, and I, I make the argument in my Newsweek article that uh, it was very unfortunate that the Warren Commission didn't come to a clear, compelling, single, understandable explanation of how. You know, when they went in May 64 to restage assassination, the most important thing for them to, was to prove the single bullet theory was plausible, was correct. If they didn't do that, there really was a conspiracy. So... The first shot, which was the logical conclusion, if one shot hit two of them and the third hit the president in the head, one missed. Well, you know, how important was it? It hit James Tag, but it only scratched him. You know, they didn't even decide whether it was the first, second, or third shot that was fired that missed. They entered, you know, for them, it seemed like it was most likely the third one that missed. Interesting. Except that nobody in... And Dealey Plaza said there was another shot after the shot to the head. So that didn't hold water. And you don't see any evidence of more than three shots? No. Anywhere? No. Let me ask you this. I interviewed Clint Hill. Um, You know, he jumps on the back and everything. If the driver had sped up at that instant... Uh, might might they have survived? The shots might have missed, but but because he didn't he didn't accelerate for a bit. Right. Well, th- this is a very interesting question. Clint Hill actually, the first shot didn't register with him. And if you look at him in the Zapruder film, you see that not, he's one of the eight Secret Servicemen who doesn't move. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, he keeps while, his eyes on the on Kennedy's really. Right, and it's the second shot that's that galvanizes him into action. Now, if you read his testimony, he thinks that he claims that was the first shot and that there was a shot, you know, that fired while he was running to the car and then there was a third shot. But that's impossible because you can't fire the rifle that quickly. So that's... But your question was, would evasive action... Yes. Possibly, yes. But the driver would have had to recognize the first shot instantly as a rifle shot, which... He did not do. And to be fair to him, if you read his testimony, he didn't know whether he was driving into trouble or out of it. Interesting. When he talks about hearing that first pop, and he did hear it, he didn't recognize it as a rifle shot, but he did hear it, he worried about the overpass. Oh, that he might have been driving right into it. Right. 
So, uh, and then he actually, if you look at the Zapruderfilm, you can see him looking backwards, which of course he shouldn't have done, but which is a human reaction. He, he wasn't, you know, at that time the drivers were not trained like they are today. Innovative moves. Yeah, uh, but to answer your question, yes, if he had immediately, instantly recognized the first shot and, you know, pressed the accelerator right away and swerved the car wildly, yeah. Oswald would have had a hard time. All right, as we uh, as we finish up, is it is it, it's the 100th anniversary uh, of what would have been his birthday. Do you feel any sense of obligation that, that getting to the truth honors his memory? Do you have any link to that at all? Well, there's a famous quote from President Kennedy about the truth. I can't recall it, the exact words of it at the moment. So in a way, I do feel that establishing it does honor his memory, um, or what he would have liked to see. I think he would have been uncomfortable or looked askance at, you know, what's happened to this country because, you know, today conspiracy theorizing is is more common than the truth. Well said. You've been listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Thanks to Max Holland, a systematic uh, and profound investigation of uncovering a new theory and explaining the missing bullet. Thanks to Max Holland for another great interview, for coming back on here. See everybody next Monday on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell.